I would like to introduce our first finalist. We have 10 finalists today. Um, and our first finalist is Bao Tram Huang. Um, Bao is from the Center for Horticultural Sciences. Um, the principal uh, advisor is Nina Mitter. And um, she's going to tell us about a different way of controlling diseases by spraying. Uh, let's hear Bao. Thank you. Have you ever struggled to keep your plants healthy? Might I face rust wet flies to never feel the suspect that destroyed my garden? And it's not just me, it's a problem that Australian farmers also face. It's a global pest problem. Insect pests and crop disease have resulted in up to 40% of global crop yield loss as well as reduced crop quality, leading to substantial economic losses and a reduction in food security. Conventional approaches such as genetic modification and chemical sprays have accepted issues and major health concerns with associated environmental risk, not to mention the rapid acquisition of insecticidal resistance in over 1,000 pest species. So we want novel crop protection strategies that can overcome these challenges. RNAi interference, or RNAi for short, since its discovery has been studied extensively for its potential as a powerful tool for crop protection against virus, fungal pathogens, and insect pests. This non-toxic and non-transgenic approach exploits a natural regulatory mechanism in the eukaryotes, which can inhibit specific vital genes leading to mortality in target organisms. Interestingly, Effective RNAi response can be achieved by spraying double-stranded RNA molecules or dsRNA onto plant surfaces. However, why dsRNA as a foliar spray can produce robust RNAi response in chewing insects? In some cases, plant uptake and internal translocation of dsRNA are fundamental for systemic protection against viruses sucking pests and fungal pathogens that do not consume the plant tissues. So for my thesis, I investigate whether plants can take up spray dsRNA and if spray dsRNAs can be translocated within the plants for systemic protection in various host plants. I am interested in looking at how leaf morphologies can act as barriers to foliar uptake of dsRNA and how I can overcome the barriers with the use of adjuvants. This will help me formularize a more effective delivery method for dsRNA as a foliar spray. In addition, I also challenge the stability of spray dsRNA in non-controlled environments where dsRNA is protected by nanoparticles. My research findings hope to shed light on the development of efficient delivery of spray dsRNA with an aim to optimize the sustainable RNAi-based crop protection strategy for few applications. Have you ever struggled? All right, uh, great presentation by Bao Tram Huang. Now we know how to protect our crops. Um, let's just continue to our second finalist. Uh, the second finalist is Mohamed Kamran. Mohamed uh, is, uh, comes from the Center of Animal Science, uh, principal advisor being uh, Dr. Peter James. And, and apparently Mohamed is getting uh, buffaloes resistant to flies. Let's see how he is doing that. Thank you. Buffalo flies are a big problem for Australian cattle industry, costing the industry almost $100 million every year. They irritate cattle, cause buffalo fly lesions, and reduce weight gains up to 30 kg per buffalo fly season. We have noticed that some cattle carry less number of buffalo flies, while the other cattle in the same herd carry higher number of buffalo flies. And we know these differences are inherited. Therefore, 
my study is investigating how to measure those differences easily or easily identify the cattle that are resistant to buffalo flies and use them for breeding purposes. Well, we can count the buffalo fly numbers directly, but it is very difficult and time consuming task. Especially these buffalo fly can move between cattle. Therefore, I am looking into different indirect criteria to select buffalo fly resistant cattle using camera techniques and accelerometer techniques. We have found that with the increasing number of buffalo flies, buffalo fly avoidance behavior also increased. And these buffalo fly avoidance behavior include head tosses, ear flicks, leg stomping, and tail movements. Especially the head tosses were very well correlated. So can we use these buffalo fly avoidance behavior as an index of buffalo fly number to select the resistant cattle? Well, measuring those buffalo fly avoidance behavior would be as difficult as counting the buffalo fly numbers. So can we use another technique? Yes, we are using accelerometer. These accelerometers on the ear tags are recording the movements of the animal. And with a lot of videography and with the collaboration of University of Sydney, we are hoping to develop some algorithms that can help us to select buffalo fly resistant cattle based on their buffalo fly avoidance behaviors. And we can also select those cattle that carry high buffalo fly number for selective treatment. And those algorithms can also help us to perform some farm management techniques for example, measuring the economic thresholds to apply different treatment strategies. Yes, by using these indirect criteria, we can select buffalo fly resistant cattle. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, well done indeed. Um, let's just uh, go to our third finalist, um, Harrison Lamb. Uh, uh, would have guessed from the Center for Animal Science. Um, the principal advisor of uh, Harrison is uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Ross. And a very, very compelling title. Uh, uh, Harrison is going to explain us how to read the book of life, nothing less. Thank you and go for it, Harrison. A, C, G, and T, the four DNA bases. These four DNA bases make each one of us who we are. We each share 99.99% .99 of our DNA with our friends, strangers, and family. But it's the small amount of variation, that 0.01% that makes some of us taller, gives some of us blue eyes, or unfortunately for the male population, make some of us go bald. It's the same amount of variation between apple trees in an orchard or cows in a paddock that drive profitability and sustainability in agriculture. So just imagine the potential if we could read DNA like we read a book. DNA certainly wouldn't stack up very well against, say, The Great Gatsby or To Kill a Mockingbird. After all, you can't make that many words out of A, C, G, and T. At Cat, tag, no, not even Dr. Zeus can make that a bestseller. But DNA tells us a story in a very different way. DNA can tell us which apple tree will survive a drought or which cow will produ produce less methane. Ultimately, DNA can tell us how to make more from less. More meat, more milk, more corn, more wheat, more food from less less land and less environmental impact. Scientists have been reading DNA for years and they've found thousands of spelling mistakes. A's where there should be C's or G's where there should be T's. And each one of these spelling mistakes makes a different story. Some of these stories have a happy ending and some not so happy. I wanna teach farmers how to read DNA. I wanna take the lab to the farmer. I'm developing software and a pipeline to use a portable DNA reader to read DNA on farms. The DNA reader, which is the size of an iPhone with the right software, 
will give farmers the ability to choose the story the DNA tells us about their farm. This technology will help them match lambs to mothers, choose the right cattle for their region, or identify disease outbreaks in minutes rather than months. I've already demonstrated that this portable DNA reader is as accurate as identi at identifying small spelling mistakes as lab-based technologies. In the next 12 months, I'm going to trial this pipeline remotely on farm, and within two years, we will have a prototype pipeline ready for scaling. This research is going to let producers make fast, accurate decision using nature's book of life so they can produce more from less. Excellent presentation, Harrison. Thank you so much. Um, now, our fourth competitor today is Jasmine and Go. And Jasmine is going to tell us about how to balance uh, health with sustainability and excellent taste of food. That's a very good challenge that I'm looking forward to learn about. Jasmine, your turn. Picture this, you're at the supermarket doing your weekly shop. While scanning the shelves for usual groceries, something new catches your eye. With a label promising it to be healthy, tasty and good for the environment, you have high expectations, only to be disappointed. As consumers, we're constantly wanting food products that are healthy, sustainable for the environment and most importantly, delicious. Unfortunately, these three things don't usually get along too well. Coffee creamers are a prime example. So what exactly are coffee creamers? Well, coffee creamers are essentially a more affordable milk substitute used mainly in countries where milk is expensive, like Singapore. It functions exactly like milk, giving your coffee a creamier flavour and fuller mouthfeel. So what is the problem with coffee creamers? You see, as consumers, we are becoming more health and environmentally conscious, and there are certain ingredients we don't like seeing in our food products one being palm oil and another being chemical food additives. And it just so happens that these are two core ingredients in coffee creamers. So my research is looking at how alternative vegetable oils and plant-based emulsifiers like plant proteins can impact the aroma, flavour and most importantly the mouthfeel of coffee creamers by using both instrumental measurements and human taste testers. By using suitable instruments, we're able to physically see how different ingredients affect specific properties like particle size and even friction behaviour, which may be related to certain mouthful sensations we feel when consuming it. Chemical measurements will enable us to specifically identify compounds that affect the aroma and flavour of the creamers based on different ingredients. So far, in my research, I've found that although a tiny amount of emulsifier is used, compared to vegetable oil, emulsifiers have much more dominating impacts on both the physical and sensory properties of creamers. This is already a promising start, suggesting that palm oil can potentially be replaced by alternative vegetable oils that are healthier and more sustainable without compromising in product quality. My research will continue to explore the mechanisms of plant-based emulsifiers and the role they play in affecting the physical, chemical and sensory properties of creamers. With the rising popularity of plant-based diets, my research has the potential to support product development extensively in the food industry beyond coffee creamers. Ultimately, helping companies to deliver new products that can tick all the boxes being healthy, sustainable and most importantly, delicious, ensuring that as consumers, when we try something new, we won't be disappointed. Thank you, excellent presentation, uh, Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine um, just joined the Center for Nutrition yes. and uh, Food Sciences and uh, the principal advisor, Jasmine, is Associate Professor Heather Smith. Now, we'll go from uh, CNFs to crops, and uh, there might not be a direct link to most of you between crops and pizzas. So to make that link, we brought uh, the real thing, the genuine Italian to talk about pizzas, of course, and Charlotte Rambla will tell us about 
how can we improve the roots of a pizza? I don't think I got it right. I, I better listen to you, Sherlock. Thank you. I'm from Italy, and as you know, Italian people have a genetic predisposition in loving pizza. Pizza is made by flour that is made by wheat. So wheat is very important for us, but it's also one of the most important staple food crop providing 20% of the daily calories and protein. However, with climate change and increasing global human population, we need to increase wheat production and being sustainable for our planet. But how can we produce more wheat to feed the growing world population in a more sustainable way? One of them, one of the solutions is developing roots with better roots. But why better roots? Roots contribute up to 16 and to 63% of the total plant biomass, enabling the plant to absorb water and all the nutrients needed, and also helping actually plant to the soil. So with better roots, the plant will perform better. In my project, I'm doing something new. I'm trying to create optimized root system specific for each environment and soil profile. If we develop a root system that could be beneficial for that particular environment and soil profile, it will be possible to improve water and nutrient use efficiency, and the plant will perform better. But why my research is new? Roots have been seen for many years as the dark side of the plant. Researchers have always focused on improving the above part, the fancy one that flowers and produces seeds, but studying roots is very challenging and also time consuming. We have developed tools that will help speeding up root research and to design roots with appropriate configurations for the location that we want the plant to grow. So for example, in Australia, in the northern growing region, such as Queensland and New South Wales, the soil is very deep and the water is located deeper into the soil with rain just during the summer in this situation, we need deep roots that can dig into the soil and reach the water. On the other hand, in Western Australia, soils are sandy with sporadic grains. In this case, we need roots located on the top soil, since the water in sand like just spread away. Thus, implementing, for example, just two root traits, such as root angle and root biomass, we can now develop different configuration of roots and make them more efficient. What I want you to remember is we need to find radical solutions over the next 30 years if we want to achieve food security and be sustainable for our planet. One of them is designing roots that suited to different soil profiles and growing conditions. Indeed, with better than roots, we can save pizza. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, uh, Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, uh, principal advisor, is associate professor Lee Hickey. Congratulations to both of you. Now, let's go back to the Center for Nutrition and Food Sciences uh, through uh, Apoorva Ray, who is our next uh, finalist, finalist number six. Apoorva is main uh, principal advisor, is associate professor Tim O'Hare. Now, Apoorva seems to have solved a conundrum how to put together in corn sweetness and purple. Let's hear it. You may know about purple corn, but have you ever heard of purple sweet corn? Because the purple corn produced in the world is not sweet at all. On the other hand, sweet corn available in the market is not purple as well. That means there is no purple sweet corn in the world. But what's the reason for this? The reason is a very tight genetic linkage that stops sweet corn from being purple. Well, to explain genetic linkage, let me ask you one question. Do you know of any person having everything but no heart? Is it possible? No, because it's a genetic trait linked to a person's physical characteristic. In the same way, the purple corn color is linked to non-sweet trait, while the trait that gives yellow sweet corn its sweetness is linked to non-purple character. As a result, we simply haven't got purple sweet corn in the world, not yet, anyway. So, 
The main aim of my PhD research was to develop purple sweet corn. But the big challenge was how to unite these two opposite traits. Sure, we could try genetic engineering, but if you want a naturally nutritious purple sweet corn, then the solution is tearing apart this extremely close genetic linkage naturally to recombine these two characters, purple and sweet. However, it's not straightforward, otherwise it would have been done before. But the good news is, using a number of crossing combinations over five field experiments, I have developed purple sweet corn for the first time ever. Initially, out of a field of 6,000 plants, five of those linkages separated to allow the purple and sweet traits to recombine back together, just as predicted. That's cool. Now we can produce billions. I also performed biochemical analysis and molecular research and got fantastic results. Now I am performing gene sequencing and analysis of my purple sweet corn for future breeding and commercialization. Last but not least, why do we need purple sweet corn? Well, though we all have hearts, sometimes we experience heart problems, for example, high blood pressure. The purple pigment in my sweet corn is anthocyanin, and anthocyanin is linked to reducing high blood pressure. It's not just colorful, it's good for your heart. So when you see this naturally nutritious purple sweet corn in the supermarket, don't be astonished. A lot of people out there who want healthier food don't want it manipulated in a lab. This purple sweet corn is 100% naturally nutritious. So have purple sweet corn, be disease free. Thanks a lot. You Thank you so much, Porvo. Well done indeed. That was truly sweet. Uh, so now we have a, the seventh finalist and, and it's it's an, another ray. And, and I say because once you get to vote, uh, please make sure that, that we have this two rays uh, in our shining coffee. Now, um, Jane Denise Ray comes from the Center for Horticultural Science. Um, her um, principal advisor is Professor Andre Drenth. And I think that after you hear her, you will agree with me that she does literally go bananas. Let's hear that. Have you ever been touched by the hand of history and felt that a banana finger was pointing directly at you? Just over a hundred years ago, on a small island south of Sulawesi, the banana farmers here noticed a problem with their plants. Now the fruit were green on the outside, but the pulp was rotten, red, slimy, and completely inedible. And the cut stem oozed red sap and made the plants look like they were bleeding. So they called it blood disease. Now the disease swept through their plantations and the farmers lost everything. Within a few short years, these unproductive farms were abandoned. The disease was then found endemic in southern Sulawesi and able to infect all varieties of banana plants. But the disease was not known from anywhere else in Indonesia, nor anywhere else in the world at this point in time. So they put quarantine in place, preventing the movement of banana plant material from this region. Now this quarantine was incredibly successful and for over 60 years, there were no further detections of blood disease. The disease was almost forgotten until in 1987, the disease showed up in West Java, and from here, the disease spread rapidly across Indonesia's vast archipelago and recently showed up in Peninsula Malaysia. Now, my project investigates how the bacterium moves from plant to plant within a plantation and from island to island. So we demonstrated that the bacterium moves on the bodies of insect, birds and bats from diseased to healthy banana plants. The bacterium is also highly tool transmissible and long distance dispersal is through the movement of contaminated plant material. Now, should an incursion of blood disease occur here in Australia, we now have a much better understanding of the biology of the disease to assist with an eradication. 
Blood disease is certainly an emerging threat to Southeast Asian and Australian banana production. Blood disease is certainly a pathogen on the move. Just look at the map. It's moving closer and closer to Australia. Now, if you love your bananas and want to make those bodies sing, then what happened in Indonesia is certainly of relevance to you. It is relevant to all of us. Thank you so much. Great presentation, Jane. Um, we're going to stay with the Center for uh, Horticultural Science here. Now, careful. I think we are at war, but everyone stay calm. We have Wei An Tsai and Associate Professor Ralph Ditson um, that will keep the war against the virus at bay. So let's hear how can we um, face plant virus from we on side. Do you know not only us, but also the crops and vegetables that sustain our daily lives are also afraid of virus diseases? Now, let's take a look at this picture and think about the situation plants may encounter. If we were those plants, it's probably very hard for us to fight against the virus diseases because we cannot wear masks, we cannot keep social distancing, and we cannot run away if the weather is too hot or too cold, which make us feel sick. Luckily though, some plants varieties naturally have stronger immune system, which helps them survive during virus infection. And we call this group of plants as virus resistant plants. By breeding these resistant plants, scientists make it possible to manage plants virus diseases and secure food production. However, life is always difficult. From previous studies, we know that under the global warming scenario of high temperature, plants resistant to virus diseases sometimes will be broken. Besides that, some questions still remain to be answered. For example, how does this resistant breaking happen at high temperature? And how can we avoid the resistant breaking occur? These questions therefore lead to my research interest. In my study, I'm working with capsicum plants, which are among the top 10 vegetables grown in Australia. And the virus I'm working with is capsicacrosis virus, or CACV, which is the virus that's caused capsicum matter production losses in Australia. From my investigation, we have discovered that the resistance of capsicum plants to CACV will not work at high temperatures. More importantly, we found that the resistance breaking at high temperature may be because of an accumulation of some small RNA molecules. And these small RNA molecules are acting as the bad guys to inhibit plant immune responses at high temperature. By having this knowledge, we can now design an RNA structure to bind to those bad small RNA molecules. In this way, we hope plant immunity will be boosted because those small RNA molecules are no longer able to inhibit plant immune responses. Similar to vaccination, we hope in the near future, we can simply spread this RNA structure onto plants to avoid resistant breaking under global warming scenarios. Thank you so much. Great uh, presentation, Wei Yan. And uh, now that uh, we know how to win the war against plant virus, maybe it's time then to save this planet. So we'll hear Saskia Orlas on that very important task of saving the planet. Uh, Saskia comes from the Center for Nutrition and Food Sciences, and her uh, principal advisor is Associate Professor Heather Smith. I look forward to hear how can we save the planet, Saskia, or yours.
Climate change and global warming isn't breaking news. And yet, it is so abstract to most of us that we think by eating plant-based burgers, we will make the cut. But I have to disappoint you. The challenges we are currently facing go way beyond what ends up on our dinner plates. The world population is constantly growing and the pressure on clearing land for crops and livestock is increasing, especially the production of soil, which is one of the main drivers of deforestation. With almost 80% of soil produced being fed to livestock, representing a vicious cycle of our food production. As a result, we are moving faster than ever to irreversible deforestation, leading to an increased pace of global warming, loss of biodiversity, as well as disruption of people's cultures. Seaweed can help us fight the battle of these challenges. It requires no arable land to grow, it grows at an immense speed, and most importantly, it carries essential nutrients and has many health benefits. That bears the question, why don't we consume seaweed on a daily basis? So, I want to ask you, when was the last time you consumed seaweed? Some of you might recall their last visit at a sushi restaurant. And some of you may have never tried it because you don't like the smell of seaweed. But don't you worry, I got you covered. My research aims to unlock the secrets of seaweed aroma to allow for a targeted modification of volatile compounds. There exist many different volatiles that are perceived by our odor receptors of our smell organs. Research up to date has only identified around 150 volatiles present in seaweed. For example, the volatile dimethyl sulfide is responsible for the sulfuric smell of seaweed. One approach to change the volatile profile of seaweed is fermentation. Fermentation is a processing method that has been around for thousands of years and served mainly as a preservation method for food. Recent studies showed that fermentation of brown seaweed resulted in a reduction of these sulfuric compounds, which proves that this processing method is a promising tool to address distinct seaweed aroma. In addition, Fermentation is also able to enhance the nutritional quality. As a result, fermented seaweed ingredients can be incorporated into a broader application of conventional food products, enhancing the nutritional quality of food and reducing its carbon footprint, thereby contributing to healthy people and a healthy planet. So let's dump soy and grow more seaweed to make it the staple food of the future. Great, thank you, Saska. Thanks for helping uh, save the planet. Um, fantastic presentation, indeed. Now, um, last finalist, number ten. Honestly, I never thought I was going to be introducing you to a fashion designer, at least not in coffee. But here I am introducing you to Christy Warburton, who works um, uh, in the Center for Animal Science uh, under the advice of Professor Ben uh, Hayes. Now. Christy designs cows. Really? Let's hear that. Golden Doodle, Cockapoo, Puggle, Chalky. These are the names of four of the most popular designer dog breeds in Australia today. For those of you who are unaware, designer dogs are those dogs that can be found in high-end coffee shops having walks with their owners. I'm just kidding. In all seriousness, designer dogs are hybrid dogs that have been bred to meet specific niche market requirements. A gorgeous example of this is the Golden Doodle puppy on my slide. Golden Doodles are a cross between a Golden Retriever and a Poodle, and they've been bred to have the intelligence of the Retriever whilst having the hyperallergenic fur of the Poodle. Many of you may be surprised to learn that there are a number of Australian beef breeders who have something in common with these designer dog breeders, and that is that they harness the inherent genetic differences between different breeds of cattle to breed progeny that meet certain market expectations. You may wish to refer to these as designer cows, and there is a lovely example of one of these designer cows on my slide. In any animal breeding enterprise, one of the most difficult decisions is about which animals to include into the breeding program as parents. 
It is often quite difficult to assess which animals will make the best parents based upon physical inspection alone. So beef breeders have been using genetic selection as a tool to predict the progeny performance of parental selection candidates before these animals have even been mated. Recently, beef breeders have been able to take a DNA sample from these parental selection candidates and use their DNA sequence to estimate their predicted progeny performance. And we can do this with reasonably high accuracy within breed or within breeds that are closely genetically related. However, the challenge for the Australian beef industry is that there are a large number of breeds that come from genetically very different backgrounds. And this makes accurate estimations of progeny performance between these breeds very difficult based on the DNA sample alone. So the aim of my research is to investigate the genetic differences between these different breeds of cattle and use this information to develop a tool that will help us make more accurate comparisons between these genetically distant breeds. This will allow beef breeders to be able to make selection decisions upon which animals to include in their breeding program as parents across a larger number of breeds and to help them breed these designer progeny that meet their breeding objectives. We believe that the use of this tool will help beef breeders to become more productive, more efficient and sustainable in their beef breeding business long into the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christy. That was a, a, an outstanding presentation indeed. Um, now, uh, it's time uh, for um, you, uh, all of you, to vote for your favorite uh, finalist presentation. That was the last one and closed the 10 uh, selected uh, finalists. So I think uh, Nicole has been working on what you see in your uh, screen um, and you can start just uh, voting. We'll allow a couple of minutes so that everyone has a say. Uh, so please uh, vote uh, to your favorite presentation. I know it's a difficult task. The 10 um, presenters have been outstanding. I have really enjoyed their creativity and how to present their work. Uh, fantastic titles. Um, out of uh, all, if you ask me, I thought the titles were really, really well thought and, and very entertaining themselves. Uh, so um, um, I'll let you with the thinking of which one was your choice uh, and I'll um, just uh, shut up for a couple of minutes. And um, when I come back, we'll be to just announce uh, the winners of this competition, starting with the people's choice, uh, then the runner up and, and the final final winner. I'll, I'll leave you with the thinking on who you vote. Please vote in the poll. Thank you. I'll just give you guys one more minute for voting. It's, I've almost got, uh, uh, I've got 66 out of 76 voters. So if anyone else wants to vote, I'll give you another 30 seconds to a minute and then we might close the polling uh, very, very soon.
All right, uh, Nicole, I think we're ready to go, right? Fantastic, I think we do have a, a winner. And so uh, let's continue uh, with uh, the session and announce the, um, uh, the winner. So people's choice, um, uh, because this is not my 3MT, I'm allowed to do additional noises. And the winner is, you guys have uh, selected uh, winner people choice. Um, and I'm reading going bananas. Well done and congratulations to Jane Denise Ray. Yay! <laughs> this is uh, the Zoom meetings, they are funny, aren't they? Um, but I know that everyone is applauding. Yeah, look at that. Selena is applauding and Claire, thank you. Thank you. Everyone is uh, very happy and uh, congratulating you, uh, Jane. Well done. Fantastic. It was really a very good performance. All right, then um, let's continue uh, now on the. Um, the other other prices. Uh, so we'll finish up um, with uh, the uh, runner-up and the winner, who were, as I uh, will um, um, remark, by our three uh, judges. And uh, let me just remind you that the three judges were um, um, Nick McLeod. Uh, Acting General Manager of Horticulture and Forestry Science from DAF. Ben Baldwin, uh, Director of Agri-Food and Data Sciences, Crop and Food Sciences of DAF. And Jess Logan, uh, DAF Partnerships Manager of Coffee. To the three of them, again, um, uh, a lot of our gratitude showing them our gratitude. Thank you so much for that. So, no further delay. Runner-up uh, is... Ta -da! Christy Warburton for the set from the Center for Animal Science. Um, uh, Christy's been advised, or his uh, current advisor is Professor Ben Hayes uh, of the Center for Animal Science. Congratulations, an absolute uh, brilliant job, Christy. Um, well done indeed. Fantastic. Um, uh, and then last, the um, final winner of this competition. Remember that the winner and runner-up will represent us in the Institute finals. Uh, and the judges uh, have agreed that the best presentation of this year's 3MT goes to... We and Tsai, we are winning the war against viruses. Well done, Wei An. You are the winner of the competition and you will be representing us uh, in the Institute's final. I hope that um, you will win also that final and get farther on into the final of the UQ and the uh, Asia Pacific final. Absolutely well done. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Wei An, uh, are you there? If you want to just uh, show who you are and, and uh, that would be great. Uh, and um, it would be fantastic to to see put a face into um, into that that prize. Are you are you around, Wian? You may not. Hi. There you go. Hell you. <laughs> I'm here. Congratulations, Wian. Really outstanding job. How did Thank you do that? Tell us. I did, I I don't know. I did I didn't expect that. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel so many people are so good. <laughs> Well, you're as good as anybody else, if not better, that shows. So absolutely, thanks for uh, participating. Uh, thanks for such, a, Thank such a, good, a good job. I see lots of uh, congratulations, even from the panel. Uh, oh. uh, the judging panel is uh, obviously here and they are congratulating you and obviously everybody else. So um, look, I know you didn't expect to be on stage, so uh, yeah. I'm not expecting a big, a big speech here. But uh, I think it's excellent that we all see your face and, and how, how well represented we will be in our institute's final. Absolutely well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and with that, uh, Nicole, I think uh, 
we are done for today. Is there something else? Uh, oh, question and answers. Oh, because we have our two finalists, uh, Wei Yan and, and, and Christy. Uh, Christy, are you also uh, here? Can you please um, um, see if you're around and maybe we have some questions to address? Christy, are you Hi, here? Jenny. Yeah, I'm here. Thank oh, you. Hello. Congratulations. Uh, fantastic job in designing Kauf. That was really a very, very good presentation. That was excellent. So let's see if, if we have any, any, um, any questions. Uh, Nicole, have you seen any questions? We have a lot of, uh, a lot of congratulations and a lot of cheering around. Uh, is there... Um, I'm just wondering if Jane is here at all as well, just to say hello and... Yep, um, I'm here. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, Jane. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, well done, Jane. That was really an enthusiastic presentation. That was really engaging. Congratulations with your performance. Well, I was really um, entertained and, and impressed. Well done. So, um, um, a lot of congratulations, um, Nicole. Do you actually see any question that we? that any of the audience would like us to address? Um, not at this stage. Um, I'll also let um, those um, finalists know um, I will be in touch with you um, with, with your, um, um, your voucher uh, and also all of our participants, including those that um, uh, were uh, unable to be presented today, uh, you'll all get a certificate um, and I'll let you know when you can come pick that up as well. Um, uh, the Institute finals, uh, they're actually to be determined. Um, I will send an invite um, possibly out in the next week or so um, with some more details about that date. Um, we'll go through that in the next slide as well. Um, but that should be announced shortly. So, um, okay, right, uh, 25th of August. Oh, the, the Institute's final is going to be announced. All right. Okay. I see that. All right. Uh, look, if there's no other uh, comments or questions, uh, I think uh, we're ready to close this uh, three minute thesis. Uh, I would like to thank everyone involved, uh, starting with Matthew, um, Nicole, thanks for organizing this, the uh, judges, thanks for your contributions, and especially, of course, the uh, students, this is your show. I think uh, it has been very successful. You've been really good. I think every year I see better and better presentations. That, that's really, really encouraging. So well done to everyone. Uh, a big clap to uh, uh, Jane uh, and Christy and Wian for their prizes. Well deserved. Um, and uh, Nicole, back to you for the final uh, um, closure. Great, thanks, Eugenie. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone involved. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you uh, to our judges, uh, Nick, Jess, and Ben. Um, thank you for everyone for answering my questions about helping with finding people to assist. Uh, thank you, of course, to Eugenie. You did a great job and we were all giggling even though we were on mute. Um, and yeah, and again, congratulations to all um, our winners. Congratulations to all the students who took the time to make a presentation. Um, we did watch all your presentations. We thought they were all fantastic. And it was a really tough uh, call to decide who was the winner. Um, I mentioned in the chat that the People's Choice was very, very, very close. Um, and I was about to announce it and then it changed. So uh, there, are f there were a few in there that were very close to getting that People's Choice too. So I think you all did a great job. Hopefully next year, we will have our in-person event. Um, fingers crossed, it would be nice to all get together and, and catch up. So thanks again, everyone for coming today. If you've got any questions, after the event, please feel free to email me, um, but I'll be in touch with um, all the participants um, in, in a day or two.